All right, hey guys, it's Miss Summers with your notes today on climate change. So yesterday we looked at factors that affect climate, and today we want to look at how climate can be influenced by multiple factors or by multiple things. So how does it change over time and what does that mean for us? So let's start with how climate is different than weather. So write down what you remember from yesterday. And hopefully what you remember, climate is a long-term average pattern of weather. So an average pattern of weather, it's something that stays pretty constant over time. Weather changes from day to day. Weather is short-term, climate is long-term. Now, we are very interested to know how climate changes because climate affects things like food production, it affects habitats, it affects what we can do, really. So, we want to look at natural versus anthropogenic. So natural are natural events that can cause climate change, which we're going to look at today. Tomorrow, we're going to look at anthropogenic. And if you break that word down, anthropogenic, anthro means man, or human, really. Um, like an anthropologist studies ancient peoples and civilizations. Genic, like Genesis, oh, go back, means origin or beginning. So anthropogenic is human activity that starts climate change. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. Today, we're focusing on the natural events, right? So one event that can change climates are volcanic eruptions. Volcanic eruptions cause excess dust and ash or, yeah, release excess dust and ash, and that makes the atmosphere less transparent. So imagine a window, um, which is sort of what the atmosphere is like. You know, it can either let light in or not. If the atmosphere is less transparent, light can't get through, which means the surface is not heated. So less solar radiation is able to heat the surface. And we call that a negative greenhouse. Blah, blah, blah a negative greenhouse effect. So normally we think greenhouses are warm. A negative greenhouse effect means it gets colder. So volcanic eruptions actually make global climate cooler on average. So let's take a look at an example. This is like one of my favorites because it, it affected so many more people than you would have thought. So Mount Tambora is right here. You can see on that little map, um, President Trump announces Thursday we'll meet with Kim Jong-un. That's cool. Good for you. All right, moving on. Mount Tambora is right here. It's in Indonesia on that plate boundary, so you have a lot of volcanoes. And Mount Tambora erupted very violently in 19, er, 19, wow, in 1815, and it caused all this ash to be released into the atmosphere. Now, this ash took quite some time to travel, but as you can see, it traveled all the way through India, the Middle East, all the way to Western Europe and parts of the United States. Now this 1816, the year after the eruption happened in Europe was called the year without a summer. The reason is all this ash blocked the sunlight and what that caused was the temperature to decrease. You had a lot of very dark days very cold, rainy days, and it just kind of sucked in general. It was not a fun time to be out. And you can see how much Europe changed, oh, if that thing would move, here in this purple part in France and, like, Switzerland. The average temperature dropped by 3 degrees, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about an average, that's a really big deal. Um, so, yeah. Fun stuff, Mount Tambora, yay. A fun side note, a literary side note, if you like science fiction, you can actually thank Mount Tambora for that. Thanks, Mount Tambora. Um, a lot of people don't know this. The very first science fiction book, one of the first science fiction books ever written, was written by a lady named Mary Shelley. She was on vacation in Lake Geneva in Switzerland with her hubby, who was also a writer, and a bunch of their writer friends. And they were stuck inside for an extended period of time because it was, like, really dark and, and rainy and gloomy, and they just didn't want to go outside. 
So they had a writing competition because that's what writers do in their spree, in their free time. They like to see who can write the scariest story or whatever. And she ended up writing the beginnings of what would become the book Frankenstein, which is really kind of cool. So it's sort of unintended consequence of that. But that's a side note. Moving on. Yellowstone. Here's another volcano. It has not erupted in some 70,000 odd years, but let's say it did. Yellowstone is basically a great big volcano. So we want to look at what's going to happen. So I'm going to play this little video for you. Hopefully an ad doesn't pop up. No ads, no ads, no ads, no ads. And I want you to think what is going to happen. So it's about four minutes long, so please sit back and enjoy. What is up guys and welcome back. So today we're going to look at what would happen if Yellowstone National Park were to erupt. If you enjoyed this video make sure to leave a like and to leave a comment letting me know what you think. Also I really appreciate all the support in my last video and uh, stick around for more awesome content. Alright let's get started. Good pandering there. Nice pandering skills. Yellowstone National Park is a 3,500 square mile nature preserve in the state of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. It is a common tourist spot because of its incredible views and wildlife, but underneath Yellowstone lies the most powerful supervolcano on the planet. It contains enough forest to wipe out most of the U.S. and lower global temperatures for years. So, what would happen if Yellowstone were to erupt this year? Before the blast, there would be serious warning signs something was about to happen. Massive earthquakes and unusual behavior from animals within the park would be a big giveaway. The ground would swell with most of Yellowstone being lifted. Eventually, one of the earthquakes would break the layer of rock that holds the magma in, which measures 35 by 55 miles wide and 3 to 9 miles deep. People in the immediate area might have some warning to get away, but it wouldn't be enough. Flights would be grounded all over the country, maybe even the world, and life as we know it would come to a halt, as people would likely be in panic. The eruption would have 2,500 times the force of Mount St. Helen in 1980, and be larger than any nuclear bomb ever tested. Anyone within a 100 square mile radius would instantly be killed, and Wyoming and the surrounding states would be wiped off the map. The eruption would blast approximately 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash into the sky, which would spread throughout the world and lower global temperatures by up to 20 degrees for years. 620 cubic miles of lava would pour out of the volcano, which is enough to coat the whole United States in a layer 5 inches thick. Within days of the eruption, the toxic gases and chemicals from the blast would get into our atmosphere, which would get into our rain and be extremely toxic for humans, animals, and plants. Three to five feet of ash would coat North America up to 1,000 miles away from the volcano, making the whole continent virtually inhabitable. Within weeks, millions are dead and a worldwide famine greater than anything we've ever seen would set in. Volcanic ash would still rain down in multiple parts of the world, which is extremely toxic. The world would be in a nuclear winter. Global economies would be crushed as governments struggle to figure out what to do. According to scientists, the last eruption of this magnitude caused for around 85% of land species and 95% of ocean species to be killed. Civilization would be pushed to the brink of extinction. Modern technology would mostly be destroyed, but those farthest away would be our only hope to survive. Even years after the blast, global temperatures would still be abnormally low and life would be difficult. No one knows exactly how long it would take for things to get back to the way that they once were. Now, I know all this sounds very scary, but we're actually in luck. No! No! While scientists do say we are overdue for an eruption, one won't likely happen for tens of thousands of years, maybe more. The last eruption happened roughly 640,000 years ago, and on average there is an eruption every 700,000 years or so. So, in reality, we actually have very little to worry about. Thanks for watching. Alright. Fun stuff. So I was wrong on my date. Sorry about that. No, wrong one. Right here. So. There's Yellowstone. Present. Okay. Fun stuff. So what would happen climate-wise? I mean, a lot of stuff would happen, obviously. But the most important thing that I hope you learned or saw there or listened or whatever is that the change in temperature. The change in temperature, because it would be so dramatic, you know, 
imagine dropping an average of 28 degrees. That's a huge plunge. That's going to affect our ability to grow things like crops and feed everybody. And that's what causes famine. So it's something to think about. And that's why we are concerned about volcanoes. Even if they're not nearby us, they can still have an impact on us. Right. So moving on to our next natural event that causes climate change are the El Ninos and La Ninas. So El Ninos are events that occur every two to seven years. And they are most noted for causing South American climates, particularly along the western coast right here, to be warmer and wetter. Now, a little background on El Ninos. They were first named, um, I want to say about 150 years ago or so, is when people first started noticing them and started recording them. They're called El Ninos. If you take Spanish or you speak Spanish, you know El Nino means the boy. And it refers to the time of year that El Ninos begin. They usually are noted or they start around December time, so around Christmas. So that's why it's called that. Fun fact. So how does an El Nino happen? That's a really good question. Normally, you have trade winds that push water towards the western Pacific. So in a normal condition, trade winds push towards the west. And that causes cold water to come up by South America and everyone's happy. In an El Nino, these winds weaken or sometimes they completely reverse. Now, the fun thing is nobody is 100% sure why the trade winds weaken. We just know that they do and that begins this process. So maybe you'll figure it out. Who knows? So the trade winds weaken. Forward. Step two. Because the trade winds weaken, water in the eastern Pacific, so that's by South America, gets warmer. And you can see that in this, in this um, picture. I guess that's what it is, a picture. Here by like Peru and all that fun shenanigans, all this water is a lot warmer than it's supposed to be because upwelling has stopped. All right, upwelling is this cold water coming up. In El Nino, you don't have upwelling because the wind can't push the warm water away. Now, what that causes, that you're like, okay, that's really cool, Miss Summers. Like, why do I care? Well, because in South America, conditions get warmer and wetter. And you might be like, that's cool. I don't live in South America. Why do I care? Well, South America, especially off the coast, their economy relies on fishing, all right, which is part of the global food supply. So if the water gets warmer, the native fish suffer. Remember when we talked about thermal pollution, if the water gets too hot, the fish can die. Also, cold water has the nutrients that the fish need to survive. So this is going to kill a lot of fish, and that's a bad thing. But what's even cooler, it doesn't affect just people in South America. So if you look in your notes, which I have somewhere here in this, in this mess of my desk somewhere, you have this picture in your notes. So if you look at El Nino's, it doesn't just affect these folks over here. It affects folks in Australia in Southeast Asia, in China, in India, um, even in Eastern Africa. And look here in the United States, up through um, Texas and New Mexico and Arizona, Northern Mexico, and there we are. Look you there, during El Nino years, it tends to be wet and cooler here. So we'll get winters where we have heavier snow. Um, a fun one, in 2010, there was an El Nino event occurring, and you get these warming bands up here through Canada. Now, why that's important, Vancouver's right here. In 2010, the Winter Olympics were in Vancouver, and on opening day, the temperature was 65 degrees. And that's a real big problem when you're trying to hold the Winter Olympics. It's very hard to make snow when it's that warm. So it affects everybody. It affects the whole wide world. So El Ninos make it warmer and wetter. If that's all you remember, I'm cool with that. That's why. Okay. So the effects, again, are going to depend on where you are. South America gets wetter. In Australia, you get drought. Cool. Now let's talk about La Nina, our last thing really fast. 
La Nina, again, if you speak Spanish or you know Spanish or you are learning Spanish, you know that La Nina means the girl. It's called the girl because it's the exact opposite of the boy. So La Ninas are the exact opposite. They happen when trade winds get really strong and really push water towards the western Pacific. So instead of the water getting warmer, the water gets colder. You have more upwelling and South America becomes colder and drier. Colder and drier. So if you, if all you remember from this guy is El Ninos get warmer and wetter, and you remember that La Ninas are the opposite, you're going to be okay. La Ninas get colder and drier because the winds get stronger. Moving on. Oh, no, JK not moving on. You should have the last thing in your notes. Um... You have a map of La Nina conditions. I want you to look at how those change. Actually, I think I do have that picture. I think it's in the wrong one. Do, 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 do. Moving on, moving on, moving on. Oh, no. There we go. Hey, <laughs> I just had to switch PowerPoints. Look at North America and see how we're affected by La Nina's. So here it's dry and cool, colder and drier. But here in North Kakalaki, that's where we are, y'all. This yellow means we're drier and warmer. And think back to February of this last year, guys. Think back to February of this last year. This February was the warmest February on record. We broke so many records in February for high temperatures. And wouldn't you happen to know... It happens to be a La Nina event going on right now. So that's why we're experiencing that. Okay, I'm going to jump back over to this one. Present. And we're done. Now, what did you learn? I want you to go back to my website. Under today's lesson, there is a link for a Padlet. I want you to write two things that you learned. And then you're going to start your assignment for today.